software support for quantum computing. Um, as Henry already mentioned, currently I'm at Northeastern University, but soon I'm going to be joining Rice as an assistant professor. So in terms of quantum computing, uh, we've heard a lot about it in the recent years, but the field actually started a while ago. In the 80s and 90s, we had Richard Feynman come up with the concept of quantum computing. And then we were able to demonstrate one qubit and two qubit gates in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then more recently in the mid 2010s, we had the first quantum comp computing cloud. And then in 2019, Google demonstrated their quantum advantage experiment using their 53 qubit Sycamore quantum computing chip. And then in 2021, we saw the 127 qubit quantum computing chip. And we're seeing larger and larger quantum computers going forward. But a fundamental problem still remains, which is that all of this hardware tends to be very noisy and it makes the output error prone. So whenever you run a quantum program on the hardware that we have right now, the output tends to be, contain a lot of error. So an example of this is shown here. Here we have the two outputs for two types of problems, TFIM transverse field icing model and Heisenberg. And these are problems that perform time evolution of a multi-spin system with non-zero interactions between the nearest neighbor spins. And as we can see here in both the uh, graphs, we have the ground truth, which is shown using the black dashed line. And then we have the actual output from performing a run on the quantum computer. And we can see that this output doesn't match the expected ground truth. So there's a lot of discrepancy between what the ideal output should be and what we actually get because of the noise in the hardware. And I propose solving these problems using software and system software support. So in terms of the quantum computing stack, it looks pretty similar to the classical computing stack we, where we have quantum algorithms, which are coded using programming languages, and then they're compiled using a compiler layer. And then we have the architecture layer, which then eventually schedules it on the quantum processing unit. So my research focuses specifically on the compiler runtime and then the post-processing layer, where I have works which follow on um, developing compiler passes before the algorithm is executed on the quantum computer, and then also works which uh, focus on post-processing the output of the algorithm once it has run on the quantum computer. So in today's talk specifically, I'm going to be talking about two of my works. One is Craft, which focuses on quantum reversibility for mapping independent correct output estimation. So this is a post-processing work. And then there is Quest, which focuses on pre-compiler optimization passes to reduce the size of the program uh, so that when it is run on the quantum computer, we observe less error. So let's begin with Craft. Now, as we get into the discussion of Craft, I'll introduce some background notation on quantum computing. So here we have three quantum computers um, and the circles here represent the qubits and the arrows represent the connections between the qubits. And this is typically the layout I'll use for representing a layout of a quantum computer. And then a single qubit, which is a circle in any of these topologies, can be expressed as a superposition of one of the two basis states, zero and one, where each has a amplitude alpha and beta. And when you measure them, the state collapses and the qubits can be found on one of the two basis states, zero and one. And the probability of measuring zero state is um, the norm of alpha squared. And the probability of measuring the one state is the norm of beta squared. So the norm of alpha squared plus the norm of beta squared adds up to one. And this notation can actually be extended to an n qubit entangled system. So the state of the qubit, which is psi, can be represented as a superposition of all of the two to the n states, where each state has a complex coefficient, which represents the amplitude corresponding to that state. And the sum of the norm of all of these complex coefficients is one. So if we look at the output, it actually is a probability distribution. So here we have a probability distribution of a two qubit output where we have four different states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And we have probability of measuring each of those states. And a quantum circuit is a circuit representation of the quantum program. 
and it's represented as a sequence of gates which are applied one after another to a set of qubits. So in the example shown here, we have four qubits and each of them have a horizontal line which represents the time. And the gates are being applied to these qubits which are represented as squares and then the circle. The square here represents single qubit gates and then the circle connected to another qubit represents two qubit gates. And at the end of this entire computation, we have the measurement gates, which help us measure the state of the qubit. Now, each of these quantum gates can be represented as a unitary matrix U. And the unitary matrix is simply a matrix whose um, complex uh, conjugate transpose is its inverse. So when you multiply U by U dagger, which is the complex conjugate transpose, you get the identity matrix. And all of these gates can be overall combined into a larger unitary matrix by multiplying them out and taking their tensor products. Um, so once we apply U to a state psi one, we get the final state psi two. So the entire quantum computation can be represented using a single unitary matrix or a set of unitary matrix for each of the gates. So now let's look at an example of a circuit um, of a qubit topology, which is very realistic in nature. So here we have a topology of five qubits and the error percentage is shown here represent the errors when a gate is applied to that qubit. So here we have uh, individual gates having 1% to 3% to 2% errors. And then the error percentages next to the arrows represent the, the two qubit error rates. So typically the two qubit error rates are much higher than single qubit error rates, but for here, we just have this example. And let's try to um, schedule a circuit onto this topology. So let's say we have a two qubit circuit and we want to know where we can actually run this two qubit circuit. So we can either run it using circuit map A, where we have run on qubits which have 3% and 2% errors, or we can run it on circuit map B where we can run it on qubits which have 4% and 5% errors. So as you can imagine, running on circuit map A would be much better because the final output probabilities which are shown at the bottom would much closely match the correct state output probabilities compared to if we were to run on circuit map B. So many of the mapping and routing and compilation works so far have focused on this kind of trying to figure out what are the optimal paths, what is the optimal mapping, what is the optimal routing, so as to reduce the error rate of the program that we observe. But in our, our work, we try to move away from this because we know that this relies on a certain number of assumptions. The first is that the user has knowledge of which the best qubits are, which is true so far, but it may not be true going forward. This may become privileged information. And then the second assumption is that the user has access to the best qubits. And this is also true so far, but as we know, if we try to use any of the cloud computing services, typically the, the quantum computers, which have the qubits with the lowest error rates have the longest queues. So in our work, we want to be able to run on any of the qubits, any of the quantum computers that are available and still get high fidelity or high quality output. And that's exactly what Kraft tries to do. It relies on the quant, uh, concept of quantum reversibility. Um, so let's look at what we're doing here. So here we have our initial state, a ground state on n qubits. Um, and then we're trying to apply unitary operations u1 to um to this initial state. And they're applied in order. And reversing this simply means applying the complex conjugate transpose of all of those unitary operations in the reverse order. So we start applying again from U1 dagger to U2 dagger. And then the final state that we get, which is psi, would be the same as the initial state because we essentially reversed all of the operations that we applied in the first place. So let's look at a visual example of this. We have this quantum Fourier transform circuit on three qubits that is shown here. And it has a bunch of gates, um, U1 gate, U2 gate, U3 gate, and then the two qubit CX gates. And reversing this simply means that we apply the inverse the, of those operations in the reverse order to the back of whatever we had applied initially. 
So we have the three qubits, we have the original circuit, and then behind it, we apply all of the operations again, but in the reverse order. And this version of the circuit, we call the forward plus reverse circuit. And then the first version, which is the actual circuit, we call the forward circuit. So how can we actually use this operation? Well, we know that the reverse operations are essentially the same operations as the forward circuit, but they're applied in the reverse order. So there should be some correlation between the errors observed by the forward plus reverse circuit and the errors observed by the forward circuit. But we don't know the ideal output of the forward circuit, but we do know the ideal output of the forward plus reverse circuit, which is the ground state, zero. So once we run the whole forward plus reverse circuit, we'll end up at some other state, which is not zero. And we can measure the error in that forward plus reverse circuit. And then we can apply some sort of correlative mechanism to figure out what was the error in the forward circuit and correct it that way. But this task is not exactly simple. Um, so here we have three example circuits and we show the correlation between the forward plus reverse circuit and the forward circuit error of individual states. So let's say the state was zero, zero and we look at the error that was in the forward plus reverse circuit and just the forward circuit, and we try to correlate the two. And as we can see here, it doesn't exactly correlate or it doesn't correlate at all. Um, the correlation for individual state errors tends to be very low. So then we thought to correlate the full uh, error of the entire output. So this is the correlation between what we call the program error and sometimes also known as the total variation distance which calculates the difference between two probability distributions. So we look at the overall probability distribution of the forward plus reverse circuit and the overall probability distribution of the forward circuit. And we try to correlate the error in the two. And here we see that we actually do have some really good correlation and it's linear in nature. But again, the issue is that all of these correlations are algorithm or circuit dependent. So we cannot come up with a simple analytical or rule-based approach to figure out what this correlation is and then correct it afterwards. So what we came up with was actually a learning-based approach where we trained on a lot of forward plus randomly generated forward circuits and their forward plus reverse counterparts. And we trained on thousands of those circuits on different machines. And then we try to figure out what was the correlation for individual algorithms. So the table here lists all of the features that we used for the input of the training. So first we have the static features, which are just the properties of the circuit. Like for example, what was the computer that was used? What is the width? What is the depth? How many of the individual types of gates? And what is the state Hamming weight for the individual states? Next is the feature from the forward circuit runs, which are all of the percentiles of different um, output probabilities, not the actual error, because here we assume that we don't know the error of the forward circuit because that's what we want to figure out and it's different percentiles because every time you run it for a different number of shots you can get some variation in the output so we use 25th 50th and 75th percentile and then the features from the forward plus the reverse circuit runs here we do have the actual output and then also the error because we know that the output should be the ground state so we can measure the error from that state and so all of these features are related to the forward plus reverse circuit and we tried out different learning-based models from feed-forward networks to cascading networks. And eventually what we figured out was all of them were having some sort of a bias and the best model was to use an ensemble of decision trees where it would branch at every single feature and it would give us the most accurate and the least biased form of um, state error correction for the individual states in the forward circuit. So then we applied this model to, so the training was completely done on random generated circuits, and then we tested it on real algorithms. So here we have two plots. The plot on the left shows the empirical CDF of testing on randomly generated circuits. So these are circuits that were not used for training, but they're still randomly generated. And on the right, we have the actual algorithms which were not used for training, and they were just used for testing. Um, so yeah, so let's look at the figure on the left. It shows the CDF of the state error observed with Qiskit and then with Kraft. And as we can see with Kraft, we have a CDF which is much more 
shifted leftward, which means there is much lower error in the state error. In fact, in about uh, in over 70% of the states, we have 0% error. And with Qiskit, we only have 0% error with 20% of the states. So Qiskit is IBM's compilation tool, which has a lot of different compiler passes, but it doesn't do any post-processing on the output. And then on the right, we have the quant different quantum algorithms from Bernstein Wazirani to Grover's to Simon's algorithm. And as we can see, the state error there is also much higher with Qiskit. And with Craft, it almost drops to zero for almost all of the algorithms, except for Simon's algorithm, where we're still left with uh, about 1% um, state error. And then we wanted to see how effective the forward plus reverse circuit actually was with the training. So we looked at the predictor importance of the branching in the ensemble of decision trees to see which predictors were the most important. So the top three important ones are, of course, the state probabilities of the forward circuit. SC here shows the forward circuit because that's what we would expect. That's the actual state and its probability. So it would be a very important predictor. And then we see that the 25th percentile forward plus reverse circuit program error is among the top 10 predictors because um, its importance is in sort of trying to figure out what is the state error of those observed state probabilities of the forward circuit. So we see that the predictor importance was pretty high. And in fact, if we remove it, there is some more sensitivity analysis in the paper. So if we remove the forward circuit, forward plus reverse circuit features, the results get much worse and they remain pretty similar to Qiskit. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about craft. Um, and before we move on to quest, I'd be happy to take any questions um, if there are any. I don't know, um, are people allowed to unmute or should they ask their questions in the chat? Yeah, they, uh, so people can unmute themselves to ask or also can send in the chat. Yeah, in the meanwhile, I have a question. So um, if we have a new uh, new machine or in a different technology, so can we directly apply the cra uh, craft technique? So for a new machine, you definitely can. We've since tried it on a few other machines, which were not in the original paper, and uh, all of them were IBM, so superconducting mm -hmm. qubit, and it worked. I cannot claim the same for different types of technologies. We haven't tried it. Um, I, I don't see any obvious issues at the high level because it's learning based. So I should be able to learn whatever the behavior of the underlying mm. technology is, but because we haven't tried it, so uh, mm. I cannot make that I claim. Yeah. But yeah, so if there aren't any questions, then we'll move on to Quest. Um, Okay, so quest. So with craft, we were doing post-processing to correct the state error of the individual errors, but we never actually considered the specific gate errors in order to improve our output. But in reality, we know that a quantum circuit typically has a lot of C0 gates because that's what helps it um, entangle the different qubits and that would alleviate, uh, elevates its quantum nature. And because of a lot of these C0 gates, the output tends to have a much higher error rate because the C0 gates tend to have a much higher error rate than the individual single qubit gates. So in the figure on the right, we have the error rates of Cx, which is C0, which is the two qubit gates, and then U3, which is the single qubit gate. And as we can see the Cx gate has a much, has an order of magnitude higher error, expected error rate than the individual one qubit gates. So we wanted to be able to see what if we can reduce the number of C0 gates, because this problem is only expected to get worse with much larger circuits, which would only have more and more C0 gates because of the swap gates that would need to be injected in the topology um, because of the limitations of the connectivity of the superconducting technology and even for other technologies. Qubits have limited connectivity to um, other qubits. So, to do computation among two non-connected qubits, you have to have swap gates, 
which constitute our C naught gates. So these tend to get much larger as the circuit sizes get to tend to get larger. So we wanted to see what if we can move beyond the traditional compiler passes and do something really sort of um, big scale in terms of reducing the number of C naught gates. So what we came up with was the idea of generating approximate circuits with much fewer C naught gates. And if we can come up with circuit approximations, which are much shallower than the original circuit and it has much C naught gates, then we would be able to have much higher fidelity output. So here I wanted to note that we should be careful about comparing with approximations in classical computing, because in classical computing, we actually perform approximations to improve the performance at the cost of fidelity. But with quantum computing, the approximations will actually help us improve the output fidelity. So it has the opposite purpose of classical computing in that sense. So how exactly can we approximate the circuit? Well, we can do it using the procedure of what is called synthesis. So here we have um, this equation where we have the unitary matrix, which represents the unitary matrix of the quantum operation. And then we have the U prime, which is the approximated unitary matrix of our approximate circuit. And we want to calculate the difference between the two. So we use this metric called the Hilbert-Schmidt distance, which calculates the distance between U and U prime by taking the trace um, and then taking the square of the norm of the trace and dividing by the dimensions of the trace. And if it's less than a certain threshold epsilon, then we say that the two unitaries are similar, meaning that the two quantum operations, the original quantum operation and the new approximated quantum operation are similar because they have an error less than our desired threshold. Now this threshold is typically very low, like 10 to the negative eight, 10 to the negative 10, uh, because you want to be able to closely um, emulate the fidelity of the original circuit. But in our case, that would generate really deep circuits as I'll show next. So we want to be able to loosen this threshold. So the procedure of synthesis is actually generating the new circuit layer by layer, where we have parameterized gates and we try to make those gates emulate the behavior of the original deep circuit. So we start out with a set of parameterized gates and then we optimize these parameters using any optimizer algorithm, let's say atom optimizer. And then we see if the, the distance between this new um, circuits U prime and the original circuits U is less than epsilon. If it's not less than epsilon, then we add another layer. And this time we add a layer of parameterized gates and then C naught gate. But we have different combinations where we can add this uh, layer. We can add it either on the first two qubits or the last two qubits. So we can construct this whole tree because if this layer's optimization doesn't work, then we add another set of layers. And if that doesn't work, we add another set of layers until the distance is less than our desired threshold. We can keep adding layers and optimizing the parameters such that um, the distance of this new approximated synthesized circuit with the original circuit is less than epsilon. But this of course um, has two issues. One is that this can also result in very deep circuits. If we set the epsilon to be very low, then we can keep adding layers and layers. Um, and then our new generated approximated circuit can actually end up having more C naughts than the original circuit or it can be even deeper. So we don't want that to happen. We want epsilon to be a very loose threshold for the approximation. But the other issue also is that the, the distance calculation uh, metric, which is the Hilbert-Schmidt distance, is actually computationally infeasible to calculate classically for large circuits because the dimensions of U scale um, exponentially in the number of qubits. So if we have, let's say, um, a 10 qubit circuit, then its unitary matrix would be two to the 10 by two to the 10, which is computationally infeasible for larger than 15, 20 qubits on any of our current computers. Um, so we want to be able to do this in a computationally feasible way. So we came up with this idea of partitioning where we partition the circuit into independent blocks 
such that we can actually manage the synthesis of this individual blocks. So in this example circuit here, we have four qubits, and let's say we can only synthesize up to three qubit circuits. So what we would do is we would partition it in such a way that the two blocks that are done are completely independent, and we would partition into U1 and U2. And now these are um, circuits of size three qubits. So we can actually synthesize their unitaries. Um, so we end up with these two separate unitaries, U1 and U2, which of course, if we take the tensor product and then the product of, then we get the original unitary matrix U. But now we've converted the circuit into a form where um, it's synthesizable. And we can synthesize both of these unitaries individually. So it, this is the same metric that I showed earlier, but now we have U1 that is being synthesized to have a distance less than epsilon one. And we have U2, which is being synthesized to have a distance less than epsilon two. But here we have an issue, which is that when we put the U1 and U2 together, it may violate our overall approximation threshold epsilon, because we don't know how epsilon one and epsilon two actually relate to epsilon. So we need to actually be able to prove that there's some relationship between these two, and we can actually bound our overall error in the approximation. So let's work through like a proof of concept of that proof. Um, we have the two unitary matrices, U1 and U2. We have their individual Hilbert-Schmidt thresholds that U1's distance should be less than epsilon one, U2's distance should be less than epsilon two. And if we perform some algebraic, um, co algebraic computation and move things around, we can see that the overall trace of U1 and U1 prime should actually be less than n times the square root of one minus epsilon squared. So when we extend U1 to all four qubits to measure its error, that distance is actually still less than epsilon one. And then we can do the same for epsilon two. And when we combine these two to form our overall unitary, we said that the overall distance would be less than epsilon one plus epsilon two. So we actually have these two individual blocks where we can bound their distances additively. And that makes life very simple for us because for any general n qubit circuit with k different blocks, we can show that the approximation error is additive. So basically for the overall circuit, the approximation error would be less than the sum of the parts, um, which is the errors of the individual partitions. So all we have to do is we have to synthesize each of those partitions in a manner that their, the sum of their approximation errors is less than the overall sum or overall threshold that we want for the entire circuit. But this is also not exactly simple because when we do the synthesize as synthesis, as I showed earlier, it generates the whole tree and we can actually pick any approximation in any branch of that tree. So we want to be able to pick approximations that not only add up to this epsilon, but also generate the desired output. Because if we approximate too coarsely, which is what we want to do, then the output has the danger of being much farther away from what the output of the original circuit should be. So here we come up with a method of how we can pick multiple approximations such that all of their um, overall approximation error is less than our desired epsilon threshold, but also their picked such that their output is similar to the original output. So it's demonstrated here using this visual. So let's say our target output is the red cross, which is shown in the center. And then the circle around it shows the approximation distance that we want. And then because we are trying to pick very shallow circuits, which are coarsely approximated, this boundary is going to be very large. And we pick one approximation in it, which is called synthesis samples, which is the blue square. Then if we just pick one approximation, then that approximation's output is very far from the target output as we can see here. But if we pick, if we pick multiple synthesis samples uh, from this as is shown with five samples, then we can make sure that all of their average output is close to the target output. But each of these synthesis samples is a much shallower circuit than the original circuit. So they'll all have much lower error because of the hardware noise. And all of their average would actually be the same as the target. Um, so the key here is to pick 
the samples such that their average is the same as the target output. And we use the triangle inequality to figure that out because we want to make sure that the, each of the samples we pick is actually average. So we first pick the first sample, which has the minimal number of C naught. And then the second sample not only needs to have the next minimum number of C naught, but also should have should satisfy the triangle inequality, meaning that its distance to the target should be much lower than its distance to the first sample. Because if they're both on the opposite side of the target, then we have an optimal um, sort of combination of the two because their average would be the same as the target output. But of course, we're trying to do this using the unitary matrix matrices, and we don't know how exactly this will affect the output. So that's why we pick multiple samples, up to 16 samples, um, and we pick them doing using this triangle inequality so that we can hope that their um, average output is the same as the original circuit. So overall, there are three steps. The first step, as I said, is partitioning the circuit into individual blocks so that we can synthesize them. The second step is to in parallel synthesize all of these blocks. So this will generate different synthesis outputs for all of these individual blocks. And the third step is to select from all of these synthesized blocks, just the blocks that we want to put together to form our individual circuits. And we can produce up to n dissimilar. So here we call it dissimilar, meaning mathematically different so that they're all around the uh, circle of the target output. Um, so we can pick up to n dissimilar circuits such that their average would be the same as the original output. So here are some results from this. Um, we tried it on a variety of different algorithms from Adder to Heisenberg, TFIM, QFT, QAOA. And as we can see here, um, we compare it to two different techniques. One is Qiskit, which is the IBM's compiler with all of the compilation passes. Then it's just Quest. And then Quest, which is our this approximation synthesis, plus all of the Qiskit compiler passes. So as we can see here, um, the number, the improvement in the number of C0 gates is 30% on average with just Quest. And as we add Qiskit to it, sometimes it slightly improves it, sometimes it slightly degrades it. There's no, there's no sort of um, dedicated uh, benefit that we can get from using Quest plus Qiskit. But here we use it anyways, because in most of the cases we can get some benefit over Quest. But with just Quest, we can see much more benefit over Qiskit, up to 30% improvement in the number of C0 gates on average. And this of course results in, um, actually before we look at the error in the output, let's look at this approximation quality. So what the two plots show here are the two output distance matrices, uh, metrics, total variation distance and the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And they show the distance between our approximated circuits output and the original circuits output. So this is the ideal difference, not run in a noisy environment. And we can see that the, the average of all of the course approximations we picked has a very similar output as the original ideal circuit because the distances are very small. But of course, when we run it in a noisy environment, because all of these approximated circuits are much shallower than the original deep circuit, we see a much higher fidelity to the ground truth. So here we have the two plots that we had at the beginning of the presentation. And as we can see here, Quest plus Qiskit gives a much better approximation of the ground truth than just using Qiskit. Um, so with that, I'd like to sort of conclude the discussion of Quest. And I wanna spend a little bit of time on sort of the future pathway uh, for quantum computing, especially in this system software um, area. So of course we have the hybrid quantum classical model, which is um, sort of the major NISC era model. And in the near term, we have the different cloud computing platforms and we have a lot of issues related to executions on these cloud computing platforms. Then in the medium term, we have issues related to performing quantum computation at scale, including compiling, debugging, and runtime assertions, all those types of issues. 
And then over a relatively longer term, we also have interesting and challenging problems in terms of hardware uh, portability, uh, because we not only have the superconducting qubits, but we also have trapped ion quantum computers, photonic based quantum computers and neutral atom quantum computers too. So we have all of these interesting challenging problems that we can tackle from the system software perspective. And there's also a major role for large scale supercomputers and HPC systems to play in this. A lot of my research also makes use of these supercomputers to be able to design, run, simulate these types of work. So for example, with Quest, we wanted to synthesize a lot of these blocks in parallel. So we made use of supercomputing resources. And just to perform general debugging and verification, we'll need to use these supercomputing uh, systems. So there is a lot of synergy between traditional supercomputing and quantum computing. And that's sort of the research steps moving forward in this system software step, uh, um, area. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to conclude with um, that I will be joining RICE and I will be hiring PhD students for the fall of 2023. So if any of you are interested in pursuing PhD, feel free to contact me at this email, or if you're interested in research generally, then feel free to contact me at this email.